Joining me now is Sharp Gupta. He's a senior Asia Pacific International Relations Policy Specialist at the Institute for China American Studies. And, and we've talked a lot about this uh, trade deal. We've chatted with you about it. Uh, give me your sense as it now comes into effect. How is this going to shake up the trade environment? I think it's a great tonic for the trade environment in this day of economic nationalism, protectionism, uh, you know, with the virus and, and, and all the debt problems that it's created. This is, this is a ray of light of, of, of hope and that, that even in these difficult circumstances, these countries are all uh, putting their heads down and moving in the right direction in terms of market opening and market liberalization, which is just going to, to, to engender prosperity over the long term. You say ray of light, uh, but you know other people are putting, pointing it out as something quite different. Just a couple of months ago, Time Magazine had this headline, why the U.S. could be the big loser in the huge RCEP trade deal between China and 14 other countries. Of course, as you know, the Trump administration shelled the Trans-Pacific Partnership. The Obama administration had sold that as a pact that would cement the U.S. in the region and act as an economic bulwark against China. So is this basically a one-two punch? Is the U.S. going to take it on the chin because of this? Up to a point, yes. Uh, first, let's have a little clarity out here. You know, China actually did not lead this process. It was an ASEAN-led process on which China was completely on board. And that's why RCEP is essentially those ASEAN plus one FTAs. It's a harmonization of those FTAs and it's further deepening. But yes, the point you make is a correct one. Remember, it's just the U.S. which has been standing out, for example, the EU and Japan signed a FTA. Of course, the UK and the EU also have their, have the, their post-Brexit arrangements. Uh, China and the U, EU have completed negotiations on a comprehensive agreement on investment. Uh, so, yes, the U.S. is falling behind because the U.S. is not participating in these uh, market opening and market liberalization uh, frameworks. And if it did, I think it, it would be most welcome, frankly, and unfortunately that isn't the case at this point of time. Yeah, Parag Khanna, who wrote the book uh, The Future is Asian, sees RCEP as the biggest trade agreement that's ever been passed for the region. Uh, it covers one-third of the global GDP, as we pointed out, so it's massive. What's going to be the benefits to the global economy, do you think? Oh, the, you know, China has been the driver of the global economy and the Asia Pacific has been the driver of the global economy. So that to the extent that they remove barriers within themselves and amongst themselves and begin to grow faster and suck in more imports and become more product, productive, uh, it's just great for the global economy, as I said, particularly at this point of time. There are also particular elements of ARSA which are very useful. You know, we talk in the in the in the in the little piece that you ran. Uh, it was about China and ASEAN, where there was a lot of focus. But the fact of the matter is that in Northeast Asia, Japan, Korea, and and China are huge trading powers who have never got a trading arrangement among themselves, and ARSA pulls them in. So that also accentuates trade between these parties. Uh, it's a living agreement. It's structured in a way to have flexibilities for poorer countries. So this is win-win and win-win for the long term. And as a living agreement, there are countries which can accede to this if they wish to down the line. And that can, that, I think that's just a great thing, frankly. Yeah, you already brought up the region, but let's, let's delve a little bit more into that. Are we witnessing a huge shift in global power to Asia? Because one of the interesting thing is if, and we saw this in a story we aired last uh, hour, uh, it, if you reduce the tariffs, suddenly they have a lot more money that they can pour into R&D. Um, it can change things, can it? Yes, it can. It can change things. And, and, and obviously, the more productive they get and the more technologically sophisticated they get, because, you know, once they keep trading with each other, they will also keep moving up the value chain, the technology ladder, and they will become that much more sophisticated in their economic structures and operate at their productivity frontiers. And it is countries which are reticent of participating in these. And, we, and this is, just doesn't come down to the United States. I mean, you know, a country like India, which has been a great beneficiary, but could not summon the political will to join. These are folks who will fall back. India has fallen back from the rest of ASEAN and East Asia by not participating in liberalization, liberalizing frameworks. And this does, at some end, at some point in, in relative terms, have a competitive aspect to it. Mm. 
And therefore, I mean, the hope is that countries which see themselves falling behind realize that we cannot go down the nationalist route because at the end of the day, it's self-defeating. And therefore, we must change track and get down on the liberalizing path. Yeah. And that would, again, it, those are good incentives to send out to these countries. Sarp Gupta with analysis for us on the dawning of RCEP. Thanks so much. You're most welcome.